the board at the Federal Reserve reduced the reserve requirements to what? Not 10%. Zero. The banks aren't required to keep any of your money in the bank. This is insane. What is going on, traders? So by now, you probably heard about Silicon Valley banks shut down last week by regulators, and you're wondering whether this can have ripple effects in the market and the economy and create a 2008-like situation. As always, I'm not here to spread fear. I'm here to give you a realistic take based on how I see it and the data that we currently have. And as far as I'm concerned, the situation can get a lot worse. Remember that bank runs have more to do with psychology than they do liquidity. If depositors, especially at smaller and regional banks, if they feel like their money is at risk and everyone starts pulling their money out, well, they're not pulling their money out because the bank actually announced that they're insolvent. They're pulling their money out out of panic but they can create an insolvency situation if everybody rushes to regional and small banks to pull their money out. So in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly how the Silicon Valley bank situation unfolded. I think a lot of people are still in the dark about how this had to do with the Fed and the Fed interest rates. Then I'm going to illustrate for you exactly how the Fed funds rate has an effect on almost every single financial pipeline in our system. This is why over the last year, you've heard economists, you've heard analysts talk about the Fed is going to break something. They don't know what that something is because the Fed funds rate has its tentacles on almost every single element in our system. When I told you a month ago that I was selling my stocks, it wasn't because I knew what would happen. It's because I didn't know what would happen, if that makes sense. The stock market had completely diverged from the bond market and the stock market was acting like nothing was wrong, but the bond market was like, holy shit, if the Fed actually gets close to a 6% federal funds rate, something is going to break, whether it's the housing market or unemployment or a major credit risk like we're now seeing with SVB. And I'll get into that, as I said in this video. And then towards the end of the video, I'll tell you how I'm personally going to be trading in the market that's upcoming. Remember, we have CPI also on March 14th, and God forbid that CPI comes in higher than expected or the year over year number comes in even higher than the last one because that's going to create a nightmare scenario for the fed so we're going to get into all of that let's get right into it all right so before we get started we have to understand a few baseline concepts in order to completely contextualize what happened at svb and deduce whether other banks are at risk or other elements of the financial system are at risk because of this. The first thing that we have to understand is exactly how treasuries work because treasuries and interest rates are at the heart of this issue. So let's say that you buy a treasury on the market and this treasury pays a yield of 4%. But then the Fed comes in and starts raising the Fed funds rate. Well, the Fed funds rate affects treasury yield. So let's say that new treasuries have a yield of 5% because the, the Fed raised interest rates. Well, what happens to these old treasuries here if they get put on the market? Well, if investors can get 5% on new ones, why in God's name would they pay the same amount for old ones? So if you try to sell this treasury on the market, it's going to sell for less than the new one. And that is why when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And we've discussed this relationship on this channel quite a bit. So that's as far as I'm going to get into it. I just need you to understand that when interest rates go up, bond prices go down or treasury prices go down. So now that you understand this, this is really the beginning of the problems for SVB. So Moody's, which is the credit rating system, basically called SVB and told them that they were going to downgrade their credit because it had discovered that the bonds that SVB had on its balance sheet, the treasuries, remember banks buy treasuries as well, SVB had treasuries on its balance sheet and the value of those treasuries had fallen due to higher interest rates. This is what's called interest rate risk, which is basically exactly this scenario here is when you buy a bunch of treasuries, especially as a bank, when you buy a bunch of treasuries and the value of those treasuries drop because interest rates have drastically gone up. Now, everybody and their mother knows that Jerome Powell and the Fed was going to raise interest rates. So what do you suggest a responsible bank would do in that scenario? Well, there has to be ways that a bank manages that interest rate risk. Yes, traditionally, a responsible bank would manage their interest rates by buying up bonds with different durations, right? If the bonds that you're holding, the value of them have dropped because the interest rates have gone up. Well, you could buy new bonds with new interest rates and different durations, or you would hedge that fixed income investment by using things such as interest rate swaps, uh, options, other interest rate derivatives that are available to banks on the market. And most banks actually do this. SVB didn't do this. Moody's found this out 
And that's why Moody's called them up and was like, hey, we're about to downgrade you because all of these bonds that you have on your balance sheet, they are not hedged and they've all declined in value. So here's where the problem got worse for SVB. SVB then was worried about this downgrade because obviously if you're if you're a bank and your institution is downgraded by a I'm not even going to say reputable institution like Moody's, those of you in 2008 know from 2008 know what I'm talking about, but anyway, Neither here nor there, an institution who is downgraded publicly, obviously that undermines the confidence of investors, of depositors, et cetera. So SVB was right to worry about that. So they rushed to find a solution and they're like, okay, if we sell all of the assets that we're allowed to sell, basically most of them are treasuries as well as mortgage-backed securities, then we could raise cash and try to reposition ourselves for this mistake of not hedging the treasuries that are on our on our uh, balance sheet, even though we knew that the Fed was aggressively hiking rates, I still don't know how this happened. Obviously, as we discussed in this little il illustration here, that the value of bonds go down when interest rates go up. So they're going to be selling those treasuries and those bonds. They're going to be selling those at a loss, right? Now, in order to backstop that loss, what they their plan was, what they were going to do was they were going to uh, sell shares in order to fund that loss. Now, this plan, as CNBC called it in this article, absolutely backfired. The news of the capital raise literally spooked clients, investors, etc., especially at a time like this when reverberations from 2008 are still at the top of people's minds. And what ensued was called a bank run. A bank run is just a fancy term for depositors rushing to the bank to take their money out and panic. Now, this brings us to our next concept that we have to understand, something that is very problematic, and that is called fractional reserve banking. What is fractional reserve banking? I promise you, if you're a beginner, you will get this. I'm not trying to confuse you or lose you. I think it's very important that you actually pay attention to this. But what is fractional reserve banking? Fractional reserve banking is basically this. Imagine you deposit $1,000 in a bank, right? Because you might be thinking to yourself, hey, why do bank runs happen? If I deposit $1,000 in the bank and I rush to the bank to pull out that $1,000, they should have it, right? I put $1,000 in there. Wrong. This is where fractional reserve banking comes in. So when you put $1,000 in the bank, right, the bank actually isn't required to hold that $1,000. They can historically only hold 10% of this. And so they're going to hold $100 and they're going to loan out $900 in the form of loans, right? So say somebody wants a mortgage, they want a car, they're going to use your money to loan out $900 of the money that you put in and use that for loans. And they obviously charge an interest rate on these loans. And that's how they make money. So they're paying you on your $1,000. A bank is paying you, I don't know, let's just say something paltry, like 0.2%. Um, and they're loaning out $900 at say 4% or 5%, depending on, on you know whether someone's using it for a mortgage or a car loan or whatever. And this difference right here is how the bank makes money or one of the ways in which a bank makes money, right? So fractional reserve banking allows a bank to basically only keep a portion of your money in the bank and use most of your money as a way to lend to businesses and consumers alike. And that's how banks make money. Now, the government and the Federal Reserve will tell you that this is what allows the country to grow. And without this, the country would not grow or at least grow in perpetuity. And so this type of almost like, I don't want to call it a Ponzi scheme, but almost a way of creating phantom money is really what allows uh, countries like the US and other economic superpowers to maintain a growth status, right? But what happens when you come for this $1,000? Well, if it's just you, there's probably no problem with it, right? There's really no problem with it. If it's every single depositor is coming for their $1,000, well, the bank's going to be like, we don't have it, right? Because we're using your money to loan out. And in normal banking circumstances or normal economic circumstances, nobody really is interested in, in rushing to the bank to pull out their money. But now if you think that the bank is actually at the risk of shutting down, then everybody's going to be rushing to get their $1,000 out. In this case, we're talking about millions of dollars. 
uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, right? And the bank is going to go bust. And this is exactly what happened. Now, I'm not going to touch on it in this video uh, so much, but 10% used to be the fractional reserve requirement, meaning the banks were only, if you deposited $1,000, they're only required to keep 100 of that and loan out 900. In 2020, this really flew under most people's radars because not, not enough people talk about this. In 2020, the board at the Federal Reserve reduced the reserve requirements to what? Not 10%, fucking zero. The banks aren't required to keep any of your money in the bank. This is insane. I might make a follow-up video on the history of this, why this happens, but I'm not going to touch about it in this video, but I do think you should know about this. So know that right now the reserve requirement for banks is 0% effective as of March 26, 2020. So because of this bank run, regulators quickly stepped in on Friday, shut they shut down the bank and they put it in receivership. If you guys remember, if you're old enough to remember, this actually happened to Washington Mutual, a bank that maybe some young folks don't even know by name, but a lot of you who are around my age or older will remember Washington Mutual very well. And in 2008, that bank was put into receivership and I believe was acquired by JP Morgan, uh, eventually turning it into JP Morgan Chase. So we don't know yet what's going to happen to SVB. Is it going to be acquired by a bigger institution? Is it going to uh, just fail? And all of the companies, a, a list of companies have come out. We'll go over what companies so far have been uncovered. Uh, you know, that their money is deposited at, at SVB. You know, are all the companies and depositors going to lose their money and the bank just be allowed to fail? Is somebody going to come in and swoop them up and buy it and try to make those depositors whole? Uh, are we going to see a bailout as of, you know, as of today, Janet Yellen quickly came out and said, we're not going to bail out SVB. And this is, therein lies the problem is because, or one of the problems right now, we're dealing with a major inflationary scenario where the Fed is actually raising rates aggressively to combat inflation. If the government comes in, prints more money to bail out SVB and other banks that may follow, and we'll talk about the risk of that, then they're creating, again, an inflationary environment, and we're back to square one. So I think it was right of Janet Yellen to come in and say the government won't bail out SVB, but we've also seen politicians lie all the time, say one thing and then end up doing another, especially as it relates to bailouts and printing money. So hopefully the government and the Treasury keep their word about this. In my view, I don't think that SVB should be bailed out. I think that creates a scenario where, once again, we are subsidizing uh, private companies' losses and putting that on the taxpayer. And not only that, we're doing so in an inflationary environment where right now we just cannot afford to let inflation come back roaring. It's going to upend everything the Fed did. So there are some major publicly traded companies that do have a lot of money at SVB. Roku was one of them. As you can see here, Roku, it says that it held approximately 487 million, almost a quarter of its total cash as Silicon Valley Bank, but also a whole host of startups that Silicon Valley Bank was really, uh, the, the idea of Silicon Valley Bank originated to allow uh, or, to, or to provide startups with liquidity and with money that other banks wouldn't give startups. So I think there's a thousand startups that have their money at Silicon Valley Bank. So not only could the bank obviously fail, but all of those startups uh, could get wiped out as well. And then publicly traded companies like Roku, Roblox that have their money with Silicon Valley Bank that could have ripple effects on some aspects of the stock market. And here's another piece of troubling news. Only 2.7% of Silicon Valley Bank's deposits are less than 250000 So why is this important? right? Meaning that 97.3% aren't FDIC insured. So what is FDIC? Another uh, basic concept that we need to understand. Again, I'm not going to bore you. You are going to learn from this and uh, this will be beginner friendly, but FDIC is Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, this is basically an independent federal agency and banks pay a premium just like you would pay premium at your insurance company for your car or home insurance. Uh, it provides insurance to U.S. banks in the amount of $250,000 per depositor. 
This means that, you know, if you have a million dollars in the bank, yes, you are basically giving the bank an unsecured loan for $750,000 because only 250,000 of that million is insured. And if the bank goes under, 750,000 of it goes uh, goes bust, goes in the air. So this is why this information is important because most of Silicon Valley banks, again, I mean, they have a lot of startups who have millions of dollars in the bank. Only 2.7% of the money at, or the accounts at SVB are less than 250,000. Most of them are not FDIC insured. So FDIC insurance is not going to cover most people. Now, while FDIC is cool, it's not meant to cover every bank in the system. It's not really meant to cover uh, even one regional bank like SVB, which is the 16th largest bank in the US. FDIC currently has only around $120 billion on its balance sheet. And even though it's a regional bank, it's considered the second largest bank failure in US history after what I just referred to earlier was Washington Mutual. SVB has $212 billion on its balance sheet. So FDIC only has around $120 billion. FDIC cannot cover bank runs uh, at this scale. Now, it's important to note that the FDIC has never not protected a bank account up to $250,000. But again, that's sort of a misleading stat because what about you know bank accounts that are more than $250,000? So you know, the FDIC's claim is that they've always paid out uh, the maximum allowable compensation for each bank account. But, you know, if your bank account is $100 million, what is 250K? Sure, FDIC will pay you 250K, but what about the rest of your money? And unfortunately, now we are seeing a contagion effect because regional banks from Louisiana to Boston, we are seeing people lining up in fear trying to pull their money out of small banks. Now, I do think that the JP Morgans of the world, et cetera, are probably okay, but regional banks, uh, you know, if, if they're if they're small in nature, well, I think the smaller they are, the more people are going to panic. And this is what would lead to something that is coined in the banking industry called contagion. So as we discussed before, contagion is just as much a psychological issue as it is a liquidity issue. Uh, just the panic effect, and especially because we have that ridiculous fractional reserve system where banks aren't even required to keep any of your money anymore uh, in order to promote perpetual growth in the economy and loan out as much of the money you deposit in the bank as possible. This contagion effect can occur purely out of panic. If everybody's panicking doing bank runs on smaller regional banks, well, that's all that's needed in order to create a liquidity crunch among a lot of these banks. And this leads me to uh, one of the points that I wanted to, to discuss is exactly why the Fed funds rate is such a blunt tool and why economists and analysts get scared when the Fed is hiking aggressively. And this is part of the reason why I had pulled out of the stock market after that insane rally to start the year, because inflation was being revised higher for out of the last five months. The bond market was predicting an absolute collapse and the Fed funds futures were ticking higher. So the Fed funds rate, let's just call this the Fed rate, it is so far reaching and it has its tentacles in every single element of our financial system. So when the Fed funds rate goes up, obviously it affects uh, car loans, right? When the Fed funds rate goes up, it obviously affects housing. It makes housing more expensive. It makes small business loans more expensive, right? Small biz loans. But what else? When the Fed funds rate goes up, it affects treasuries, right? Treasuries, the price, as we discussed before, the price of treasuries or value of treasuries goes down and the yield of treasuries goes up. Now, this obviously affects banks because banks have a ton of treasuries on their balance sheet, as we saw with SVB. Not only that, but if treasuries are paying you 5% yield now because the Fed funds rate went up, hence treasury yields went up, and now treasuries are looking attractive, well, guess where you're not going to keep your money? In banks. And if banks don't have your money in order to use for loans, well, that's going to have an effect on banks' profitability. And more importantly, if banks do not hedge the fact that treasuries are going up, just like with SVB, and they just let these I don't I still don't know how this happened but they let these treasuries just sit on their balance sheet 
losing value because new treasuries are going up in yield. So the treasuries that you have are going down in value. Well, for small banks that don't manage the risks properly, it's going to it's going to burst that pipe. The Fed funds rate also increases the cost of corporate credit, right? So corporate credit, the cost of money for corporations goes up. When that happens, well, corporations now are forced to pay more. So what do they do? They hire less employees. So it affects the employ employment market. And if a bunch of small businesses and uh, startups are you know, housed at these regional banks that are now at risk, well, that's going to affect them too, right? So startups, small businesses. And these are just a few of the ways that the Fed funds rate affects our uh, global economy, right? So it just shows you how far reaching the Fed funds rate is. That's why when the Fed starts hiking these rates very aggressively, it it un, it always uncovers a systemic and problematic issue, whether that's with housing, just like in 2008, it was uncovered that, you know, basically mortgage companies were giving a mortgage to a squirrel with a pen, or in this case, that banks that acted irrationally and didn't leverage their interest rate risk are now under pressure, or whether it raises the rates so much that we have mass firings, which uh, thankfully, by the numbers at least, it appears that unemployment is still historically low. The point is we don't know where the issues are going to be uncovered, but we do know that there will be, if the Fed keeps raising rates long enough, something will crack. And this is why we have never achieved a soft landing. And the hope of the Fed every single time that it does quantitative tightening, they hope that they can bring inflation down before something happens. That never happens. <laughs> Interest rates are such a blunt tool that something always occurs and now we're seeing it. And unfortunately, it's in the banking sector where the reverberations of 2008, the ghost of 2008 still looms. So before I get into how I'm going to be trading in the current environment, I mean, let's talk about whether this is a systemic issue. Now, it could be. Again, bank runs are just as much psychological as they are uh, about liquidity, right? I don't think the larger banks are at risk in the same way that they were in 2008, but I do think there are so many regional banks in the US that this could actually be an issue. And if an institution doesn't come in and buy up Silicon Valley Bank, then not only is the bank likely, well, it, it's already collapsed, but not only you know are depositors not going to get their money, but startups and companies that have their money housed at SVB are also not going to be able to make payroll. So that's going to lead to a lot of employees being laid off and not paid. But someone has to stop a bank run contagion from occurring. I don't know what powers the FDIC has beyond what's on its balance sheet. I don't know what the government can do besides print more money, which I hope they don't do in order to bail out banks and stop a contagion, right? Someone, depositors at smaller banks have to be reassured that their money is safe. And unfortunately, that is going to be very hard to do without printing money, whether it's a government agency providing more funds to the FDIC, whether it's the Treasury and the government stepping in and bailing out Silicon Valley Bank. I'm hoping a private entity can come in and buy Silicon Valley Bank and make those depositors whole in order to stop the contagion. I'm really hoping because other bank runs could happen. Now, if on March 14th, when the CPI comes out, if it's higher than expected or if the year over year is higher than it was last month, well, then I think that we will see a crash of epic proportions. I think that we will see a you know Black Monday style crash or maybe it won't happen on one day. But I do think that the S&P 500 eventually revisits lows very soon. And the reason is because of this. It's because, let me pull up my, my chart here. Like, I do think we, we could visit these October lows and potentially break them at some point. But the Fed right now, what they're, they're hoping is that these bank runs are going to give the Fed impetus to either pause or hike very tepidly uh, in on their next meeting on March 22nd, that they would only hike uh, 25 basis points or might even pause because things in the financial system are breaking. However, if CPI comes in higher than expected, there's no way the Fed can put its foot on the brake. It has to keep going because inflation is still the boogeyman. Now, a few economists are saying that the Fed might even cut rates drastically 
by end of the year in order to prevent contagion. And if we look at the Fed funds futures for December, you could see that the uh, the, the highest probability is a 500 to 525 target rate uh, in basis points for the Fed funds futures, which is 100 to 125 basis points less than the target rate for November. So now Fed funds futures uh, betters or investors, really traders, are expecting that same thing, that the Fed will have to cut rates before end of the year. Now, in terms of how I'm trading this, I'm actually pretty pissed because I was in a two-year note futures trade that was stopped out. I basically had bought the Fed funds futures with a stop below this level here. We eventually got stopped out and not only have the Fed, the uh, two-year treasury note futures skyrocketed, this is the best three-day performance in history. So, we know we got stopped out and I missed the best three days in history for the two-year treasury note. But the reason that I bet this is because of the fact that the Fed, the uh, the two-year yield was hitting a high. We hit just over 5% and I was expecting the yield to drop momentarily from that. And it did, but it did take out our stop in the process. So, you know, I still think this is a very valid trade. I do think that these um, two-year note futures are going to skyrocket once the Fed actually uh, starts pausing, starts thinking about pausing and even cutting. I do think that in the long term, there's a lot of money to be made in bond futures or treasury futures. Same thing with the 10-year note futures, but the two-year is the one that is the most sensitive to the Fed funds rate. But right now with CPI coming out very close to the time of this recording, um, you know, it, it, who knows? It's anybody's game. If, if the CPI actually comes in uh, lower than expected, then you can expect the two-year note futures, in my view, to keep going up and the two-year yield to go down. But if the Fed, if the CPI comes in higher than expected, then the Fed is going to still have to act aggressively. And we could see those two-year notes yields continue to go up even well past 5%. So, you know, before a data drop, I'm not really going to trade it. I am going to trade the CPI live. So for those of you that love to join us live trading and like the live commentary on binary events, make sure to look out for that live notification because I will be live on CPI day. Anyway, traders, hope you got something out of this. If you want access to all of our trades, all of our analysis, uh, on the two-year notes, on the indexes themselves, futures, options, etc. Link is in the description below. Apply to be part of the academy. And if you are accepted, you will know very soon uh, after applying. So click that link in the description. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Is there going to be contagion as it relates to bank runs? Is this going to be contained? Is somebody going to come in and buy SVB? Is this just an isolated incident? Hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, stay safe out there traders, peace.